let me use the remaining 30 minutes for a uh, circuit intro. It's, uh, um, it's uh, I guess it's less of an intro, more of an overview. So this week we are starting on the topics that relate to circuits and you'll be continuing it next week with DC circuits and um, analysis of more complex circuits using Kirchhoff's rules. <laughs> By the way, um, in the lecture videos, you will hear me trying to pronounce this, this particular name, which I only found out two years ago that I've been just pronouncing it wrong for, no, no, three years ago that I've been pronouncing it wrong for 10 years. <laughs> I've been pronouncing it and spelling it wrong for, um, for 10 years. <laughs> I've been pronouncing as Kirchhoff uh, for the longest time. And that's because I've been actually misspelling this. Uh, with, I've been uh, skipping one of the H's. And I think the correct pronunciation of this Treat this as basically two two letter a uh, two word compound word Kirchhoff, and I can never really get it right. So in the lecture videos, you will basically hear me butcher this pronunciation in multiple different ways. I might say Kirchhoff, the old wrong pronunciation I used to use. I think I've heard the people say Kirchhoff. I'm pretty sure that's wrong, um, but anyways, uh, I think correct pronunciation here is Kirchhoff, but whatever. <laughs> so application of Kirchhoff's rules, that's, uh, that's the biggest piece in circuit analysis. That's uh, something that you are going to continue to see even after we introduce more interesting circuit elements than registers. Um, and so, so, you know, we are doing circuit analysis in earnest this and next week. And then we are going to leave it off for a bit uh, as we do magnetism. And then we are going to come back to circuit analysis later. And it's, uh, it's a bit disjointed. And uh, there isn't really a better way to do it because we don't want to, one, uh, in order to introduce magnetism, we do have to talk about circuits. So, or we, we do have to talk about currents. There is no talk of magnetism, oops, that's the wrong page. There is no talk of magnetism without introducing electrical current. So, um, so we do have to talk about electrical current and if we have introduced the electrical current, it's almost um, silly to not to talk about uh, circuits where current plays an important role. Role. So, so you know, this is the place in the semester where we do have to talk about circuits in some depth, and then we will run out of the materials that we can use. Because um, so in this class, you will see three major circuit elements. Um, you have seen one already, uh, which is capacitor. So you have seen capacitors in the con um, electrostatics context as um, just uh, you know something that stores charge. That's one role of capacitor. But more practical, more important role of capacitor is as a circuit element. And um, and so, so you will see that treatment in chapter 10 with the RC circuits. You will see that in the textbook chapter 10, <laughs> you will see me skipping that most for the most part. <laughs> um, so you've seen one circuit element and this week you are seeing the second circuit element, which is the uh, register that's uh, coming in with the introduction of Ohm's law. And the third circuit element is the th third of the three important circuit element, linear circuit elements in this class. And um, we have not covered enough physics for us to be able to cover that third circuit element. It's the inductor. And in order to understand the physical origin of inductor, we have to cover Faraday's law, we have to cover electromagnetic induction, and um, introducing that requires three chapters worth of material 
talking about magnetism, <laughs> what produces magnetic fields. Uh, that's uh, kind of, that's what we need a current for. And that leads to something called electromagnetic induction. And that's the, um, that's the law of nature. That is the basis for the operation of inductors. Um, so self-inductance and inductors, that's where you see the proper introduction of that third linear circuit element. And because of this interlocking nature of the physics material and the circuit material, when you look at the circuit content, it'll, it'll be broken up throughout the semester. So we cover a little bit these two weeks and then it'll be towards the end of the semester when we come back to finish up circuits. So, so I wanted to show you that overview, which you know I have done a little bit of. Um, let's see, what do I want to talk about in terms of that overview? So I think the places where the circuit content um, connects to the physics is um, it's kind of self-explanatory. And th those are the places where I, I don't think you need all, you know, me justifying the order in which things are covered. Th those places are fine. So actually what we are covering this week, I think a lot of that, I hope it makes intuitive sense. Um, even if maybe <laughs> it doesn't make as much, um, um, even if it, you don't see the kind of, uh, practicality of what we talk about. Like, uh, um, I think, let's see here. I think some of that is kind of like that, uh, maybe definition of current lecture is one among those where, you know, um, it, like it, it could be done a lot shorter. <laughs> I, you know, it takes 10 whole minutes because I think uh, the uh, proper understanding of how we define current is, useful as we look at uh, later treatment of capacitors in circuit. So, yeah. <laughs> and kind of um, avoiding some of the conceptual pitfalls when you are analyzing circuits. Uh, some of those pitfalls we had, and I guess still have in terms of lab manual, um, lab activities that are kind of designed to walk you through it. I think this happens to be one of the labs that we won't really have a um, parallel version of this semester. It's the one based on introduction, introduction to circuits. Uh, one of the questions it asks is um, uh, measuring the current through wire A and then current through wire B. Uh, current through, let's see wire A and wire B. And when people do this lab activity in person with the equipment, what they say is that whether you measure the current here or here, you measure the same current. And um, the kind of conceptual mistake that students, are ten students tend to make is to think um, the current here is maybe greater than current here. And um, so anyways, so we don't have that. So I do try to uh, spend a fair amount of time uh, in these lectures covering those concepts. So, you know, as you are watching it, even if you are not sure why is that practical, I think in terms of actually covering it, it's covered and at least uh, how it connects to the other things you have seen. I think that's fairly um, self-evident. So there isn't as much of a, I don't know why I'm sweating. Um, there isn't as much need for overview or me uh, providing connecting material. Where, um, and even the, the description of the physical origin of Ohm's law. And um, it's kind of just describing why, even though Ohm's law is not a fundamental law of nature that it's common to see. So, so the, in terms of the materials you will see this week, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. So, um, so that's kind of the transition from the physics content we've been covering to the circuit analysis. And it's the material that we'll cover next week, the chapter 10 content 
where I think you need um, there there where there's a more benefit to uh, from me providing context and um, explanation of some content that we will skip for now and come back later. <laughs> so uh, what we cover in chapter ten is something where because there is necessarily a gap a gap between what we cover now what will or now as in the next week and what we cover the week after that and then after some length of time you will see again the same material in the context of time dependent and ac circuits so i guess Um, so the Kirchhoff's rule, <laughs> Kirchhoff's, <laughs> so I know that's a wrong pronunciation, I'm just going to say it that way because that that's the easiest way I can say it, Kirchhoff's rules. Uh, Kirchhoff's rules is the main content of what we cover in the next two weeks in terms of circuit analysis. And I would say understanding its application is, that is the main thing that you learn. So I would just say focus on that. And the lecture videos kind of do um, have that um, focus slash bias. Uh, as in, um, I actually um, do things in a different order than the textbook. I introduce Kirchhoff's rules as early as possible. I do this before introducing rules for um, um, rules for adding circuit elements in series or parallel. I, um, I start with the Kirchhoff's rules um, introduction, and I, I actually use these rules to drive the formulas for series and parallel registers. This is a different approach from what your textbook does. And as I say uh, many times, it, it's good for you to see different approaches. So in your textbook, I think those formulas are uh, are they derived or given? Um, wait. They are making reference to Kirchhoff's loop law, uh, which, oh, okay. So, I mean, so they, so my approach might be then basically same as the textbook's approach. Um, the only difference is I did this uh, formally before doing this. Um, which I guess is fine. So, um, so what you will see in the lecture is basically this done in lecture to drive what the uh, formula for adding registers in series is, and the same thing with adding registers in parallel. So do does yeah. So this is the junction rule, which <laughs> they will discuss in detail in the next section, and um, this is done in lecture. So I guess it's the same approach. Um, so yeah, so the in the lecture you see me driving those two rules, uh, two um, formulas for adding registers in series or parallel using Kirchhoff's rules, and then um, and then this is the long video that shows the application of Kirchhoff's rule in um, in a general case. This is an um, example I like, an example of a circuit. That can only be solved using by use uh, by application of Kirchhoff's rule, and um, there's a kind of general structure to it. When you um, and it's a structure that you will find familiar because I try to really emphasize this every time it comes up. I uh, do it with uh, Newton's law strategy. I do it even in thermodynamics context whenever possible, which is um, recognizing how physics problem solving works in the most general form. And which is, I'm trying to go back to, yeah, somewhere around here. This setup is a very common setup, which is that by using some rules or laws or some thing that we know about the setup, we have come up with a system of equations. And, and so this is the basic approach to multi-step physics problem solving. 
um, the kind of uh, problems where you can simply plug in the numbers into a formula or where you can find the answer in a single step, those are generally represent the easiest of uh, physics questions. And <laughs> you are not here to just to be able to solve the easiest possible questions. You know, those are the high school physics questions. You are in university physics class, you are in engineering physics. So you should be able to tackle more difficult questions. And in those more difficult questions that require multi-step problem solving, the general approach is that in the first half of the problem solving, we are not even looking for uh, what looks like the answer right away. We are simply looking to collect enough information. And what I call collecting enough information, it looks like this. You are trying to find enough equations. Each equation represents information. And within each equation, you will see knowns and unknowns. And you know, knowns connect to the information. Unknowns represent um, things that you don't know. And the place where you know that you have enough information to solve the question is where you see as many equations as your unknowns. And that's what you see demonstrated here. I think in this lecture, the way I label it, I labeled the current I1, I2, I3 as the unknown. So I have three unknowns. So in the first half, I'm in the hunt for three equations. Until I find the three equations, I'm not even attempting to solve for them because I know from my knowledge in <laughs> linear algebra that if, and system of equations, I know that until I have at least the three equations, I have no chance of solving for it. So, so that's a, that approach is what's demonstrated here in application of Kirchhoff's rules. The rules tell you how to get those equations you need. And once you have enough equations, then you go through the solution steps. And I hope uh, as you follow this approach that it sounds familiar because that's what the standard strategy or Newton's law problem solving strategy was. And um, this is a quite standard <laughs> way we approach physics problems. And I guess what you knew in the circuit context is that these tend to be a uh, kind of cumbersome, you know, uh, tedious, they tend to involve tedious algebra. So, you know, this is the time to get really practiced in algebra. Uh, you know, this question, as long as it takes, this is the simplest possible non-trivial question. Like if uh, this setup was any simpler, then you could do it using this addition of elements by series and parallel. Um, and I can, there are many more ways to make this more complicated than, you know, then it'll take longer, it'll take even more tedious algebra. So, um, so, so this is a, a bulk of what I refer to when I talk about circuit problem solving. And, um, and for the time being, we'll kind of leave off here. And uh, you will see in this lecture with the uh, on capacitors, um, how we handle capacitors for now. This uh, relates to the um, part of the textbook that we are skipping for now, or more or less skipping, which is the treatment of an RC circuit or the time dependent circuit. And so, you know, in the next week, if you want to simply want to skip reading section 10.5, you actually can. I think you can still do all the homework questions and do fine. Um, for those of you who just want to read through the sections in the order they come, let me highlight some of the features that you will see again in the future. And um, my goal is to group those similar features together. That's why I'm kind of skipping section 10.5 for now, and you will see it again in the future. So, um, so this is what it, your textbook describes as an RC circuit. It's a circuit involving a resistor and capacitor that you have seen before, but you, know, you have actually seen capacitor already. So some of it you are already familiar with. You know, capacitor is a device designed to store charge. And as it stores charge, there'll be voltage difference between them. And that's the feature that will be important as we treat capacitors as a circuit element. 
that it the definition of capacitance, uh, this expression here, it leads to a particular behavior of capacitor within a circuit. And um, you can see it here. Um, so here, this is, um, let's see, can I? Let, let me do a split screen here. Uh, so that I I don't I think it's you know scrolling back and forth it's a little bit disorienting so let me do a split screen so that I can show you these equations and point to the um, diagrams where those equations relate without jumping back and forth so um, to come up with this equation here uh, what they did was they applied the Kirchhoff's loop law to this is to this circuit. This is the circuit uh, where they are charging the capacitor. And all they've done is gone around in a loop, applying Kirchhoff's rules that you will see next to it. You know, a voltage increase, voltage drop across resistor. That's what this VR is. And then I guess the voltage drop across capacitor. That's what this VC is. And uh, and they uh, substitute in the expressions for voltage change that come from the properties of each element. This comes from Ohm's law, and this comes from the definition of capacitance. And as they do that, um, you see this new feature, which is that the equation you get, if you try to treat it as a purely algebraic equation, then you don't have enough information to solve it because you have an unknown current and you have an unknown charge, you can solve it. The way to make this uh, solvable is to introduce uh, this uh, additional relationship that relates the amount of charge on the capacitor with the current through the capacitor. And when you use that, you get an equation that looks like uh, this. And this is a differential equation. And, um, that's a new thing you are going to start to see with uh, time-dependent circuits. And in some sense, it's not actually a new thing. Um, you saw a hint of this in physics 4A with the equation of motion. This is actually a quite general feature in physics, which is that laws of physics are most naturally expressed in a form of differential equations. We don't know why that is, it just is true. Uh, simple harmonic oscillators, that's why you get, you see their most complete description in the simplest possible form as a second order differential equation that you saw in physics 4A. And um, so the fact that differential equation is the most natural way to describe a system it's a common feature that you will see. And in the circuit analysis is where you will start to see that uh, more and more in, the, in all its kind of <laughs> complex glory. So, um, so, so you have to kind of learn to solve uh, some differential equations in this class. In physics 4A, uh, we kind of got away by just guessing a form of a solution. That's the solution method that works a lot of the time. And especially if you're seeing second order differential equation, that's the method we will always use. Um, here, uh, they actually use a separation of variable. And uh, for first order differential equation, that's an approach that you will see more commonly employed because you can actually, you know, uh, you don't have to guess the solution. You can kind of do it, to solve it in a straightforward way. And it's easier to explain the process for that than just guessing an answer that happens to be right. Um, so this, all this is, is what we are skipping next week. Uh, we'll return to this in a future week because the these features that you see, that you get a differential equation that describes the system, and then you solve the differential equation to actually get a, a meaningful uh, function that describes, let's say, charge on the capacitor as a function of time. Um, that's something that you are going to see, that general feature is something you are going to see, not just in the context of the capacitor, but also uh, with inductor.
your third linear circuit element. So that's uh, coming up in <laughs> chapter 14 uh, with the RL circuit, register inductor circuit. So, um, so because these two physically very different looking circuits, you know, um, this circuit has, uh, well, some voltage source, register and inductor, inductor capacitor. And this circuit has, okay, two of them are the same, some voltage source and register, and something that's gonna be called inductor. And it looks like a coil of wire, because that's what it is. <laughs> that's the um, setup where the electromagnetic induction um, can manifest, uh, become manifest. Um, and uh, these two very different, physically very different looking circuits result in a mathematical expression that look very familiar. Because here, you know, applying Kirchhoff's loop rule, you get a, a um, you get a differential equation. You get an equation of motion for the circuit that looks very similar to the equation of motion for the um, for the, the capacitor circuit. So um, I want you to make use of that mathematical analogy as much as possible. So, and you know, the approach that your textbook takes is fine. It's defensible, you know, you cover this and about a month later, <laughs> you cover this and recall back to what we covered, you know, CRC circuits, you can do it that way. I, I thought it would be, um, I would have easier time teaching it if we just grouped these together. So we just cover them together instead of spending a lot of time solving differential equations next week. And then, you know, for two, three weeks just to forget about it and then come back to it again. I thought, you know, this takes a fair amount of time and effort kind of understanding what we are doing. I thought as you are doing it, we will just uh, introduce both contexts together so that we can do them together. And uh, when we when we cover inductors, we are covering our little circuits. We are not just gonna end with this uh, thing that looks exactly the same as this. The inductors being present. Uh, so notice how as similar as these two equations look, they are actually quite different because here um, you are expressing current as a, some sort of time derivative of a quantity. This equation doesn't involve that other quantity it involves the derivative of current. So the inter interesting thing that you will see is what happens in a circuit that involves both uh, capacitors where this relationship is important and an inductor where the time derivative of current will be important. So you get a second order differential equation and that's reflected in the the LC circuit. And once we get to second order differential equation, you won't see us trying to solve. So, you know, there is, actually your textbook might, okay, maybe that makes a little bit more sense. Your textbook isn't giving you the, uh, um, may, here they will have to give you the, yeah. So this is the equation of motion uh, of that uh, LRC circuit that involves the uh, second derivatives. And um, um, so once it get to, gets to that level of complexity, I think, I don't know if even in math 3F, if you learn a way to directly solve it um, in this class, uh, we are not gonna attempt to directly solve it. What we are, yeah, and this is the analogy to the harmonic oscillator. Uh, what we are going to do is go, we are going to have a very convenient guess of a solution. And, um, and we'll approach it that way. And um, this is the place where um, we'll have to see where we are at towards the end of the semester, depending on, so, you know, if this material is optional, that's, I, I, that's kind of what a lot of classes do. Um, if we do cover this in earnest, the additional tool I will introduce that you will see um, later in the semester will be, that's the complex impedance. Um, I think I lecture on that somewhere. Uh, yeah, complex exponentials. So um, 
the, the mathematics of dealing with something like this, uh, something like something like this becomes much easier once you have the mathematical tool of complex exponentials. So, um, so we'll see where we are at towards the end of the semester. Um, depending on where we are, either this will, material will be available as an optional thing, or you know, we'll have enough time to do this as a properly required part of the course. So, so that's coming up uh, later in the semester as part of the circuit analysis, as part of um, the time dependent circuits that you will be looking at. So, so that's the overview of um, overview of what we will cover in circuits. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so we'll leave DC circuits after two weeks. And because, you know, it's a bit of a disjointed coverage and the order has to be that way because of the interlocked nature of the, the physical basis for the circuit elements and, um, and just the, uh, well, I think the, the interlocked nature of the physical basis for circuit element that is why you, you have this uh, disjointed coverage. If uh, this was um, like an upper division circuit class, where I can assume that you already have covered the loss of electromagnetic induction, then you know, then it wouldn't be disjointed the way this is here. So, so this semester, since because you are going to see circuits coverage in a little bit broken up, so. Um, so this is the overview <laughs> explaining um, all the pieces that you will see and kind of why it's broken that way.